Nick Pope shared with me some startling evidence from the Ministry of Defense's files. This is one of the most important documents to have emerged from the MOD's case files. Um, it's from an assistant director in DI-52. This is their assessment of the radiation readings that Colonel Holt and his team took at the landing site. What we have here is a plaster cast of one of the three indentations, the object that Jim and the other two gentlemen approached. It's approximately 8 to 10 inches across and about 3 inches deep at its maximum point. <clears throat> this is uh, cast number two. He made an impression of all three of the indentations and they were all identical. Now, here's the key bit. These uh, levels seem significantly higher than the average background. And in fact, and I double-checked this with some other government scientists, it's about eight times normal. Uh, so this is absolute proof positive from the MOD's own uh, documentation that something extraordinary happened. Back in America, I arranged a meeting between Colonel Holt and Sergeant Nevels one of the men who was with him that night. Well, I don't believe it. Come on, sir. How are you doing today? It's been a long time. Long time. These men shared an extraordinary experience, yeah, one that puzzles good. them to this day. Still wobble a little bit, but I make it. I was glad to have brought them together yeah, after 28 so. years. Yeah, if, you, if you've been there and done that, it's a whole lot different than those the skeptics that we sometimes run around with and they can't believe us. And A lot of the other people that were involved especially Penniston and Burroughs and all, have had all kinds of complications and career problems. I did, too. Penniston retired as a tech sergeant and probably should have made chief. Step by step, Colonel Holt and Sergeant Nevels went over what happened that night. It's, it's right on half that. Yellow, it's coming this way. It is definitely coming this way. What was going on right there? It was approaching us. Yep no way of calculating how fast it was going. It was just gone. And the turns were 90 degree turns. They were just abrupt. And, right. And there was no way, no way, that anything we had in technology then, and I don't believe the technology we have today, would allow anything that we saw to make the turns the way they turned. We met with General Gordon Williams, the wing commander of the entire base. He would neither confirm nor deny the incident. He did, however, tell us how he felt about a leaked memo written by Deputy Base Commander Colonel Charles Holt. That uh, went under the door and I didn't see it. Now, did he have a motivation in doing that? Did he think that if he brought it into me, I would have stepped on it? Uh, I certainly would have looked at it very carefully because it had some things in there that I uh, don't think we were prepared to uh, defend. Once that cat was out of the bag, you know, I couldn't put Humpty Dumpty back together again, and uh, it lived its own life. I just find this very interesting that the U.S. Air Force or, or government generally says that they don't investigate UFOs since the termination of Blue Book, and yet you're, you're convinced that there was an investigation that took place. So who gave the orders to do that? It certainly didn't come from anybody that was normally on the base other than the, the OSI. I didn't tell my wife. I didn't tell my daughter. I had a top secret clearance, and when I was told to shut up, I shut up. Sir, 11月 17日, 日光貨物機がアンカレッジで UFOを目撃した. そしてその事実が1ヶ月後共同通信により新聞隠しに発表された. What I'm about to tell you is about an event that never happened. For an event that never happened. FAA official John Callahan certainly has a lot of evidence. They brought the voice tapes. He kept audio recordings between the cockpit and the tower as the incident unfolded. He has 30 minutes of taped radar that confirms the UFO, a chart that documents all the objects in the 747's flight path, and the official FAA report. Event that never happened. According to Callahan, all of this was presented to the CIA in a private meeting. When the pilot first reported the UFO, he described it as a huge ball with lights running around it. He said it was about four times bigger than the 747 he was riding. And remember, the 747 has an elevator. And he's looking out the window and he sees something that's four times the size of his aircraft. 
What you're about to see and hear are excerpts from the actual radar and cockpit conversations as the incident unfolded. So at one time he says it's over here at 12 o'clock and 8 miles, and when the uh, antenna goes by, we see a target there. Ten seconds later, it is now behind him, six, seven miles behind him. So let's go in from, from eight miles out here to six or seven miles back here, really in only five or six seconds. When I went back to headquarters, I gave Admiral England a quick briefing and showed him the video. He set up a briefing with the President Reagan scientific staff. He told me my function was to hand this operation off to those people. And those people ended up being the CIA, the President's group, a bunch of grunts uh, that came to the meeting. The CIA said to all the people there, this event never happened. We were never here. And you're all sworn to secrecy. We are confiscating all this data. And they did. They took everything that was in the room. In those days, when you printed out something from the computer... Fortunately, he kept copies of everything back in his office. That's the end of my speech. Who are you going to believe? Your lying eyes or the government? How do you feel about your husband coming coming forward? Well, I think that that's John. Uh, John is comfortable in what he says and what he does, and that if he what he sees, he will tell what he sees, and I don't think anybody is going to tell him that he can't. And I'm proud of him. I think he does a good job, and he's telling the world what he should know. One of our greatest success stories was getting General Jafari from Iran to D.C., it took three months of negotiations to get his visa. Jafari was one of two Iranian fighter pilots ordered to intercept a UFO hovering over Tehran, Iran in 1976. The pilot in the first jet lost instrumentation and communication when he got too close to the brilliant object, so he headed back. About 10 minutes later, they scrambled a second jet, which I was piloting. General Jafari scrambled his F-4 Phantom jet to get a closer look. He gave us this Iranian Air Force reenactment film featuring the original witnesses and planes. Even though Jafari's F-4 fighter jet was traveling at the speed of sound, it was nowhere near fast enough. Imagine, when I was looking here, at about 70 miles out, and he jumps all of a sudden 10 degrees to my right. In this angle, 10 degrees, this part which it was traveling becomes about 26.7 miles per moment. I don't say per second, maybe Maybe less than a second. Jafari was flying towards the UFO when a smaller object separated from it and headed right at him. His only instinct was to shoot at it. But that turned out to be a bad idea. <laughs> 
all the instruments were fluctuating with the garments and the radio. So <laughs> I, I was really frightened. So uh, I decided to turn away and I said, if it comes closer than about four miles, I will jump out. So having maneuvered away from the object, Jafari's control panel returned to normal and he regained contact with the tower.